Our friends at Perla are big proponents of simple, long-term investing, and now they're rewarding you for being a long-term investor too. Perla investors receive points every time they fund their account and invest. The more points you earn, the higher your chances to win one of their weekly prizes or the big prize at the end of the month. To get started, check out the competition terms and conditions and open your Perla account today using the links in your podcast player. This episode of the Australian Finance Podcast is proudly supported by GlobalX ETFs and the launch of the US100 ETF, better known as N100. N100 offers Australian investors exposure to 100 of the largest non-financial companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. N100 focuses on innovation-driven companies, providing a growth tilt to core portfolio holdings. You can learn more about N100, including reading the PDS and TMD by clicking the link in your podcast player or by simply heading to globalxetfs.com.au. Hey there, here's a quick note. This podcast contains general financial advice only. That means it's not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So don't act on the information until you've spoken with your financial advisor. You'll find our full disclosure, disclaimer, and link to our financial services guide in the show notes. Kate Campbell, welcome to this Australian Finance Podcast episode. Wonderful to be back, Owen. It is. We're recording in the studio today. I've got my vacation coffee. We've all had a bit of a coffee this morning, which is nice. And we're talking about ETF investing, specifically one of the ETFs that is super popular amongst our audience. The DHHF ETF, a bit of a mouthful, which is the Beta Shares Diversified All Growth ETF. And you may be a little bit more familiar with these types of ETFs if you have listened to our VDHG review episode we did a few months back. But before we talk a little bit more about DHHF and potentially some other options, the DIY yes. approach. Yes. I need to do a double disclaimer, which is uh, the first disclaimer is obviously that any of the information that you hear in this episode is limited to general financial information. If you go and invest in the uh, DHHF ETF or any others, it's important that you understand that the information we have here is not specific to your needs, goals, and objectives. Um, A financial planner can help you out with that stuff. That said, you can also read the product disclosure statement, which is available on the ETF provider's website. So every ETF has to have one of these, and it explains a bit about the tax and the risks and so on and so forth. With that said, Kate, we're going to try and keep this concise. We're going to use some data from our broker partner, which is Perla. They've got some great data over there. And we're, we're going to answer some questions. Some of the common questions that get put into the mix when you talk about diversified ETFs or ETFs in general. But in short, it's a really interesting ETF. We get a lot of questions on it. Yeah. And this is part of our regular episode format where each month we dive into an ETF or a share and just have a look about what's going on, answer some of your questions and really give you some resources to keep doing your own research. And if you want to suggest a share or an ETF to us for an upcoming episode, we have a new submission. Yes, you can. Um, there's On every RASC website in the menu, there's an ask a question button and it takes you to a form that you can fill in and you can ask a question whether you want it to be answered here on the Australian Finance Podcast, on the Australian Investors Podcast, the Australian Business Podcast, or even inside our membership. Because we get so many questions in so many different formats, this is a much easier way to do it. So you can submit it there and you can give us a fun name while you do it. So if you want us to read your question out, don't give us your actual name, like give us something fun and uh, we'll read it out on the podcasts or in Rask Live. Yeah. And we'll also put a link to that form in the show notes. And just before we start, we do not Neither of us own DHHF. No, but actually it's funny. Yes, no, no, no. <laughs> no. And we don't have like a commercial interest with beta shares who create this ETF. But in my Perla test account for the company, we have $500 invested in A200. So we'll get to why that ties in with this yep. in just a minute. But um, yeah, so no position in this. We're recording this on the 12th of September. So Kate, tell us a little bit about the DHHF ETF. Okay, so you might be, well, hopefully you are familiar with the concept of ETFs, exchange traded funds already. Essentially, instead of having to pick which company, so instead of having to pick Telstra or Disney, you can buy a basket of all these top Australian companies or top US companies all in one go. Mm -hmm. So you just make one purchase and you've got an instantly diversified portfolio uh, among a particular segment of the market. But with these 
all in one ETFs, instead of having to buy an ETF that gives you exposure to Australian shares, an ETF that gives you exposure to US shares, maybe property, maybe small caps, these ETF providers, there's only a couple on the market so far, but I'm expecting that will change, will actually mm -hmm. put a basket of baskets together. So they'll put a bit of Australia, a bit of US, and they'll use different ETFs to build a all-in-one portfolio. And so in really one trade, you can get a very diversified portfolio, giving you exposure to different asset classes around the world, just with one single transaction. Mm -hmm. This would be like, uh, you get HelloFresh, that's a box of food. This would be like a box of boxes. So you have like multiple things in one. Yeah. So like, I don't know if there's a subscription company that gives you your food, your groceries, Mm. Um, maybe your house cleaning products. All in one. That's what this would be. Your stationary, all in one box. And it just comes with everything that you would need in a pretty simple core portfolio. Yeah. So these ETFs, as we'll get to in a minute, when we reference the Perla data, are becoming more popular for people that are focused on that core portfolio. So rather than thinking about if I want bonds, if I want how much US shares should I have? How many Aussie shares should I have? Should I have 20% or 30%? You can just buy it and it does it all for you, uh, which makes it super accessible, user-friendly, and it's good for beginners. Yes. There are some details, there are many details um, in this, which we should dive into, and I'll get to in a minute, and uh, that will help you understand why. And maybe this may not be perfect for everyone, but it may be perfect for some people. Yeah, yeah. And it's probably good to note that this ETF is really for high growth investors. It's 100% invested in companies yep, like so your shares, Disney yep. and your Telstra globally listed companies. And um, they estimate there's over 8,000 different companies in this ETF because it's made up of lots of other ETFs. So you're getting exposure to a lot of different companies just through one single trade. Yeah. So if you've ever wondered like how many ETFs should I have, um, if you just if we just focus on like what we call the core portfolio, which is like the the biggest chunk of your money invested in one kind of strategy, like long term focused, um, this this ETF kind of answers that question for you because it's saying don't go and buy all these other ETFs. Just select our one and we'll do that for you. And so that's where this comes in. And then when you think about it, if you go from inside this ETF, there might be, say, you know, a handful of other ETFs. But then within those ETFs, then there might be a thousand in one ETF and 500 in another one. So you're getting a lot of exposure through just this one investment. Yeah. And um, before we, we're going to talk a little bit closer to the end about using ETFs like this and the VDHG ETF versus doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. But I just think we'll address some quick facts for this ETF. It's been around since December 2020. So it's pretty new. Pretty new. But these products are quite new yep. um, in themselves. In fact, there's not that many available in Australia that are the diversified, diversified ETF portfolios. Uh, management fees, 0.19% per year. So on $10,000 invested, that's $19. Mm -hmm. yep. If the math is right there. Yep. I always struggle with Let's this. go with that. Um, okay. At the moment, they have nearly $190 million in funds under management in this ETF. So um, it's not the biggest ETF we've seen, but that's quite a significant amount. Yeah. So the way to think about this is this is not... When we talk about this, just for absolute beginners, when we say there's 190 million dollars in it, that does that, that's just saying how much other people have invested yep. into it. So if Kate and I put 100 bucks in, that would be adding to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as I know, they are index unaware, so they're not tracking a particular benchmark. Which but they is wouldn't for a diversified ETF. Yeah, yeah, it'd be pretty normal. Like yeah. they th with the ETFs within it do. Yeah, but not as a whole. Yeah. yeah, so we'll unpack some of the ETS underneath it because they, they will all track a benchmark that yep. you can have a look at. Uh, the distributions are quarterly, so that's the income received from the companies that are within that ETF is then collated mm. and paid out on a quarterly basis to you as an investor. Yep. And the interesting thing to note with the DHHF ETF, which I hadn't seen before and I haven't really seen on any other ETFs, is that it is an opt-out distribution reinvestment plan. So what does that mean? That means, so generally companies and e many ETFs, if they pay out income, you have the option to go into the, the registry, so link market services and computer share, and turn on the option to have your dividends or distributions reinvested. So instead of getting paid out cash, 
into your bank account, they will give you additional units in that ETF or that company. And that happens on your behalf. So it's a good way to keep growing your investment over time, especially if you don't need that income to survive on um, and keep building your position in that company or that ETF. Yep. So a few things here, just if we go a little bit uh, deeper into this, what this effectively means is that instead of getting like the cash, like the passive income appear in your bank account, it will be, you'll just see the balance of your ETF go higher and higher. Yeah. But the thing to keep in mind, as many of you will know, is that when you receive this distribution, it's called, it's like a dividend, you will pay tax. So even if you do have these automatically reinvested, you're still going to see a tax bill for this. So keep that in mind. Yeah, either way, there's no getting out of the income tax. Yeah, so it's important to keep that in mind. If you are more focused on, you know, you want to see that cash and you want to settle that in a different way or invest it somewhere else, you will need to go in and opt out of this. And Link Market Services is the ETF registry. So that's the place where you go and manage all your, your stuff. Yeah, so that's something something to note as well because it's usually opt in. You have to take that step to go into the registry and set it up, whereas this is opt out. So that's important to note, and that's why it's good before you invest in something to actually read through the fact sheets and go onto the ETF provider's website so you know all of those details. Yep, I like it. Cool. Uh, and and the ETF fund issuer, so the person who creates and looks after the ETF, is a company called BetaShares, and they have. Oh, I think over a hundred different ETFs in Australia now. So they create and manage a lot of different products. Yeah, they've um they've got. A, I think they're the biggest ETF provider by number of ETFs. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they've got a pretty big team now, and I don't think they're the biggest by fun, like as in the, the amount of money that they control, but they're definitely by number of ETFs they have thrown everything out. So. And, and the reason why it's good to know this is because if you have questions, they're the people you want to contact. And if you want to research an ETF that they manage, like the DHHF ETF, you go to the BetaShares website and then you can find all the information about the product there. And yep. any other ETF they manage, they have heaps of information there. So that's why it's always good to know who's running the ETF. Yeah, for sure. So speaking of like who, who would invest in this ETF, um, Kate, we reached out to Perla to get some data and from the Perla community, we can see the types of people that invest in this ETF and how they do it. So I think there's some really interesting things here. Um, it's the sixth highest beta shares ETF by the number of investors inside Perla. So that's pretty impressive. You know, beta shares has a lot of ETFs like um, NDQ, which I imagine is very popular. Um, it would have, you know, a bunch of different ones in there. There's like robotics, there's clean energy, there's a heap of different stuff in there. So the sixth highest within the Perla community. Yeah. And so 20th, 20th highest holding by number of Perla customers overall. So it is increasing in popularity. And it's quite interesting that uh, in July last year, DHHF was the 41st most traded ASX um, investment. Mm-hmm. And in August this year, it was the 15th most traded investment. So that means people buying and maybe selling. Mm. Uh, so it is gaining some popularity within the, the Perla broker community. And another thing that's quite interesting is that it's very much a 50-50 split between male and female investors mm-hmm. uh, that own the DHH, eh, DHHF ETF. I'm going to, that's a mouthful. Yep. Anyway, and the average age of the investors that hold this ETF is 33. 33. So... That would imply that it's not just young people adopting ETFs. It's also um, slightly older investors. So that's great. And the 50-50 male split, female split or thereabouts is is great to see as well. Um, it just reinforces that you know ETFs are kind of democratizing stock market investing, which is fantastic. Um, and I think the context here is very important. Is that so? If beta shares, um, you know, is in the teens, VDHG is currently the number three most traded. So if you think about that, um, it was, what was it say? That VDHG was the number two ETF for the f- for the first year, but in 2022, VGS, which is Vanguard's global shares ETF has overtaken it, mm-hmm. which is what I see across the industry. Like those, those ETFs, the VDHG ETF, the VGS ETF, and the VAS ETF, that's a lot of ETFs, um, are very popular, but it's good to see some diversity there. Beta mm. shares coming up the ranks. So maybe next year it will be in the top 10. Who knows? Yeah. If it keeps going this way, it might. <laughs> Which I, I would, to be honest, I would expect ETFs like this to grow in popularity because yeah. more people want something simple that they can set and forget. 
Mm. So especially on a Perla like platform, uh, a platform like Perla where you can just kind of set and forget with the auto invest feature. So you can just kind of, okay, this is the one that I like. I'm just going to set it and let it go and check in in a few months or something like that. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Cool. What about what's inside the ETF? So one thing that we talk about is when you invest in an ETF to actually check what's inside it before you um, go and just add multiple ETFs that might end up doing the same thing and investing in the same stocks or something like that. Yeah. So you can find this yourself as well because you want to make sure you're looking at up-to-date data when you have a look at this. But if you go into the BetaShares website and you're allowed to download a spreadsheet, which has their list of holdings as of a certain date. So I'm Mm -hmm. looking at the stuff that was end of August and it's made up of four ETFs as well as some Australian and US cash in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. So the first ETF that is in the portfolio, which listeners will be familiar with, is the A200 ETF. That is BetaShares' own product, Mm -hmm. and that invests in the top 200 companies listed on the Australian market. Cool. I like it. So top 200 listed on the Australian market. This is the ETF that I was saying before that the Rask Group owns 500 bucks of. We'll probably own more of it in the future, (laughs) but this is just in our demo account inside Perla. And um, so this is like just, yeah, top 200 companies, as you said. So you get that included. Yeah. So it's around 36% of the DHH ETF. Yeah. DHHF, I'm going to, yeah. When we say the ETF, we're (laughs) referring to DHHF because that's the topic of this episode. I'm just going to say the The ETF. ETF. That'll be easier. So if you had $100 invested in the ETF, $36 would be invested in the A200 ETF. Yep. So that's good to know because if you already own A200 or something similar to that, you might be overlapping in terms of your holdings. Yep. But it's not the biggest ETF inside. So it's uh, A200 is not the biggest component, like yep. piece of the pie of this ETF. So what's bigger than it? Yeah. So the one that's bigger than it is the VTI ETF. And many listeners won't have heard of this one because it's not actually listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. So the VTI ETF is the Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF, which is a US ETF investing in US companies. And it's actually listed on US stock exchanges. So you wouldn't be able to buy it through a, a ASX brokerage account. Yeah. Um, importantly, there is a, a Vanguard ETF that does pretty much the same thing here in Australia. It's called VTS. So there is, and the VTS ETF, just for those who are passionate about this stuff and they know a bit about what I'm talking about, you can buy this ETF in an Australian form, but when you buy it, it is actually the US version. So you got to keep that in mind. When we talk about where the tax structure Mm. is or the tax domicile, we call it. So that basically means which tax jurisdiction applies to this ETF. So this one is a US one, so it will definitely be US tax domicile. Yeah. So if you had $100 in the portfolio, around $38 would be invested in US companies through the VTI ETF. Yep. And there's another one. There's a developed uh, world ex-US ETF, which is a state street ETF. Yes. Also from the US. Yes. So that is the SPDW ETF. Around $19 of your $100 portfolio (laughs) would be invested in uh, developed markets excluding the US. So that's looking at companies that are on the Japanese, the UK, Canadian, French stock yep. markets. Yep. And then there's one final ETF, which we should talk about, which is the SPEM ETF. This is also a State Street or Spider ETF in the US that invests in emerging markets. So these are economies that aren't yet what we call developed. These are like the, the markets where there may be things like emerging com- uh, countries coming from second to first world. They're in that process getting like more property rights, more established governments, that type of thing. Yeah. And that would be about $7 of your $100 portfolio. So it's a smaller portion there, but you're getting access to companies listed on the Chinese markets, Indian, Taiwan, Brazil. Yep. Okay. So just to clarify, we've got $37 to $38 in the US stock market. We've got $36 in the Australian stock market. We've got $19 in all of the markets outside of the United States that are what we call developed markets, the UK, Canada, all those types of places. Then we've got about 6 to $7 in emerging markets. So those are those, you mentioned some of the Asian names there, those types of places where um, they don't have as much in, there's $6 in that. So you get that kind of ready-made mix in one go. Yeah. And then just a tiny bit of the portfolio in Australian and US cash. Yeah. Just as they transfer money back and forth. Yeah. So you're, you're getting, most of the portfolio is giving you exposure to Australian and US companies. Yep. And the, the important thing to note with the D, 
the ETF, <laughs> um, yep, yep. is that it's all invested in companies. Yeah. So it's all shares. It's whether it's Australian shares or international shares, it's all shares. So that's the key differentiator between it and VDHG. Yeah. So you're not getting exposure to potentially real estate or mm. bonds or other fixed interest products. Yeah. Which you might have inside VDHG. So that's the key difference. You've got 90% in VDHG is invested in the stock market. With this one, you've got 100%. So it's more risky is what we'd say. Yes. It's going to have more ups and downs. It's going to have more volatility you know, marginally. It's not going to be a huge difference, but that's about right. So then, Kate, I guess the question is then how do people use it? How could people use DHHF? That's one. Yeah. So I'd see this ETF as something you would use as the core of your portfolio. So we've talked about on the podcast that, sorry, uh, the core and the satellite approach where in the center, maybe 90% of your portfolio is your staple uh, low-cost diversified ETFs that give you exposure to Australia, to US, to other developing markets as well. Yep. Um, and maybe you also want to have some bonds in that portfolio or some property or some other asset classes as well. Mm -hmm. And then in maybe 10% or 5% of your portfolio, it is some more speculative things. So maybe you want to invest in thematic ETF or artwork or who knows, whatever you want to invest mm -hmm. in. So um, this this ETF is something you would have as the core of your portfolio, especially if you're a high growth investor. I would. This is a very high growth ETF, especially because you're not getting exposure to any defensive asset classes. Yeah. So it's all in the risk on bucket, meaning that all of it's going into that, that bucket of your portfolio that is seeking growth, seeking long-term performance. So um, that's one of the things you could choose it for. Uh, there are some devil in the details here, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, overall, I think we get a lot of questions on this because people are like, well, I don't want bonds in my portfolio. I'm a young person. I don't, I want to take more risk. I want to grow over the long term. So that may be fair enough. You know, you may, that's okay. You don't have to have bonds in a portfolio. In fact, there are other ways to get probably a better outcome right now. And I'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. I just say this would be a potentially a portfolio where you'd expect a bit more volatility, especially mm -hmm. because you're all in on the shares asset class and you're not really diversifying with other types of asset classes to moderate that volatility a little bit. So if you have a look at the performance chart, there are a few more steeper yeah. climbs and falls. Yeah. That's what we talk about when we say volatility. We're talking about the ups and downs. And uh, so this is your first ETF. Just be prepared that uh, you're going to see it fall, maybe it will fall by 10 or 20% from its previous high. And then it might rise quickly and then it might rise... Uh, fall again and then you know that you're going to expect that it's not going to be a smooth ride like a savings account do not compare this to something that's like you know do i put my money in shares or like, do i keep it in a savings account like th two different things yeah. it's your first etf just be prepared that it's going to rise and fall yeah it's definitely for the long-term investors here we're yep. looking anywhere from five to ten plus years yeah so over to give you an idea over the year to um the 8th of september so the 12 months to that time, it fell 8%. So it fell 8% over one month, it fell 1.1%. So that's only over a year, just, just to give you an idea. Um, obviously, when you invest in something like this, you want to be investing in it for, I would say, 10 plus years. Mm. That's probably my minimum time horizon for something like this. You're looking at 10 plus years. Yep. So keep that in mind. All right, Kate. So we've talked a bit about DHHF, but the key thing is, should people use something like this or should they DIY it? Should they roll their own, make their own portfolio rather than use something like this? Thoughts? Thoughts. Well, I would just want to point out before we talk more about the DIY ETF that you have the option of the VDHG ETF, mm -hmm. which is a Vanguard high growth diversified ETF. And one of the key things to note that's different between the ETF we're talking about today and the VDHG ETF is that Vanguard's ETF gives you a 10% exposure to the bonds, fixed interest, cash asset class. So it gives you a little bit more of a balance in your portfolio. So that might be worthwhile noting when you're comparing those ETFs depending on your risk profile. I think 10% is quite significant to note. Yeah, I think maybe another thing to note about the differences between VDHG and DHHF is that VDHG invests in managed funds. So inside the ETF of VDHG, which is the Vanguard one, it invests in it doesn't invest in other ETFs. Even though we kind of simplify it to that, it doesn't actually invest in other ETFs. It invests in funds. 
that aren't on the stock exchange, even though they are in a different form. But it invests in managed funds. And managed funds have a different tax kind of, I guess, a- application. There's different rules that are associated with that. DHHF, on the other hand, does invest in ETFs. Though you heard us say before, like the Vanguard ETF in the United States, the um, the State Street ETF. Those are ETFs. And the difference is that ETFs are more tax effective than managed funds. So with VDHG, because it invests in managed funds inside of it, you are going to get probably more tax consequences than with DHHF. That said, I'm going to add one further point of complexity, and then we'll get back to the good stuff, (laughs) is that BetaShares has chosen US ETFs. So that means that those ETFs have certain tax rules that apply to them as well. So within these two different ETFs, VDHG and DHHF, you're going to have different tax consequences. Not only that, they're also, the way they're made is a little bit, it's not perfect. So I just want, as your portfolio grows, it's going to become more important. But if you're just starting out with a thousand bucks, don't overthink it, just buy one of them and get on with it. But if you've got a hundred thousand or a million dollars, now is the time to start thinking about these tax consequences. Yeah. Good points to note. So maybe I'll just talk about some of the pros of using uh, an ETF like DHHF and VDHD, and you talk about some of the pros of using a DIY approach. Sure, let's do it. So I think these pre-mixed ETFs, and we're probably going to see more of them as investors start uh, discovering that they exist over the next few years. Mm. Uh, Firstly, it's very easy to use. It's just one single purchase in your brokerage account, whether that's Pearl or Comsec or Self Wealth or Stake. It's just one single purchase, and you're instantly getting access to a diversified portfolio. Mm-hmm. I think it makes investing a little bit less overwhelming for new investors because mm-hmm. it is just one single thing you need to purchase instead of having to work out how do I buy multiple ETFs, how much do I put in each ETF. I also think it's good for rebalancing because it happens automatically. You don't have to figure that out especially yep. when you're getting started. Yep. I think it stops you over trading because you're just buying one thing mm-hmm. on a maybe a monthly or a bi-monthly basis. Mm-hmm. Less admin and effort at tax time. You just need to give one statement to your accountant. You might have invested other things, then you need to have to worry about that too. But if you're just getting started and it's just one statement, it does make things a little bit simpler. you only got one thing to keep track of in your unit registry. Mm-hmm. It keeps things simple and hopefully makes you get started and take that first step sooner Mm -hmm. because the more complexity you add to your plan, especially if you have never invested before, the harder it is to take that first step because there's so many more decisions. Whereas if you just decide on a diversified ETF, bam, you're in. You're in. And less brokerage costs. Yeah, I like it. So all of these things, ease of use, rebalanced automatically, less effort at tax time because there's only one ETF. Um, less few, less in brokerage costs. It all just, it's easy. Yes. That's, the, that's the key point here. It's just easy. It does it for you. Now, the, what would I say if I was going to take the other side of the, the debate? Um, making your own is more efficient. So making your own from a tax perspective uh, will be better for you. If you plan on growing your portfolio to hundreds of thousands of dollars, Making your own portfolio will be better from a tax perspective. It will probably also be better from a cost perspective, at least now. So we, we mentioned the, the ETF, I think, what was the, the actual fee on it or the management expense ratio is about um, zero, uh, 0.19%. Per 0.19. Year. Then you're going to have some tax drag. Uh, so you'll have like tax implications associated with it, which may work out to a few extra basis points. So say 10 basis points, which means 0.1%. So you might be closer to 0.3% all in. Um, The automatic rebalancing for people that have a higher tax rate does actually cause issues because it every time there's a buy or sell inside the ETF, that's a tax event. Um, Also, uh, having US domiciled, so meaning that within the ETF itself, there are ET- other ETFs that are on overseas stock exchanges mm-hmm. that may create tax implications as well. When you could just do that here in Australia, you could just find the same ETF here in Australia or something close enough that is an Australian ETF and that will have better tax outcomes for you. So just in summary, you can build your own. It's going to be slightly more complex and you will have to take 
slightly more hands-on, you will have to make a decision. How much do I put in US shares? How much do I put in Aussie shares? How much do I want emerging markets? Um, I think there are better emerging markets uh, ETFs or managed funds on the ASX than mm. what is inside DHHF. Um, I think when it comes to, if you if you do your own portfolio, you can also design it so that you can add your own fixed interest ETFs over time, like your bond ETFs. Yeah. Um, I don't think anyone listening to this needs to worry about that right now. As in, for most younger people, you don't necessarily need to worry too much about bond ETFs. Uh, unless you have, you have a more conservative risk profile, then go for it. But um, I mean, we're just comparing DHHF to a standard portfolio. I just oh, while we're on this topic, I got asked this. I get asked this a lot inside yeah. Rascore, which is our membership. Um, I would use an offset account before I used a bond ETF. If I had a mortgage, use an offset account for that extra cash, or even a term deposit. We've actually recommended another ETF, which I won't name here, inside our membership. Which I think it's not the same as a bond ETF, but it it adds to a portfolio and it's less. It's shown less risk over the last three years. Um, all in all, like if you wanted to do it cheaper, you could. If you wanted to do it with more control over the tax comp- consequences, you could. Um, so I, you know, as someone that is happy to be a bit more hands-on, I would take the DIY approach. That said, what would I think of VDHG versus DHHF? That's another good question. I'd probably still go with VDHG. And the reason why is that I think Vanguard will lower its fees over time. I'm not 100% sure if beta shares will. And even if it does, because it invests in other ETFs, they have no control over that. Mm. So I would say even though VDHG may look more expensive now, and it's got slightly different tax consequences, I would probably take that if I was investing for 10 or 20 years, just because in 10 or 20 years, it will probably have lower fees. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think we both take the DIY approach, yep. especially because we have been investing for a longer period of time. Yep. We do have a larger ETF portfolio. And so we do want a bit more flexibility when it comes to, do we want to add to our Australian or our US exposure? Do we want to add or take out fixed interest? So it gives you a bit more flexibility, especially if you are intending to build quite a large ETF portfolio over time. Yeah. Yeah. And it, to be honest, like just because we do it this way, it doesn't mean that you know, I would put, I, I think this past- but like VDHG th- and DHHF didn't exist when, no, no, it's when we I started investing it. Yeah. in ETFs. So. Yeah. yeah. So like, I guess, does this pass the family or friend test? Would you suggest a family or friend invest in this thing? Yeah, probably. Because it's simple. You know, they're not going to horribly screw up by trying to buy individual stocks or something like that. So yes, it passes that test. I guess the final question, Katie, is, and this is just a generic question for all ETFs, but how do you buy or invest in this ETF? Yeah. So if you're new to investing, you need to get a brokerage account, which is really just that platform that allows you to buy and sell different investments from people all around Australia and globally without ever having to interact with them. So yep. it just makes life very easy to do so. So you're going to need to set up a brokerage account, whether I mean, we've mentioned some names before, but Perla, our broker partner on the show, is a broker. Yep. Um, also, Comsec, Self-Wealth, Stake. There's lots of different options in Australia. We have done a two-part episode on choosing a brokerage account, which I'll link into the show notes, yep. which is really good cool. if you're getting started. And you really just set up the account. Make sure you got your $500 or whatever you want to start with. You just search for the ETF so that four-letter code or three letters if it's a stock, mm-hmm. and then you can buy. Yep, cool. Um, I Just a quick little tuck in here is I was chatting to some AFLW players on a Zoom this past week, and they were like, well, actually, I've got my account set up. How do I actually buy it? And the analogy that I use is when you buy an ETF or you buy shares is you actually, unlike when you go to Amazon, you might sh- search for, I don't know, Wu-Tang jackets or something. I don't know, whatever you're searching for. Some sort of like sweater, right? Whatever. When you're uh, when you're searching in a brokerage account, you actually search by the barcode, which we call the ticker code. So that's like the three, four letters. It can be a number if you're overseas, but that's what we search by. So you search for that, then you click buy. That's it. Just buy it, mark it. There's an option. When you click on buy, a lot of people get confused in their brokerage account. It says limit price or buy it, mark it. For most people, just buy it, mark it. It's fine. Um, and if you are trying to manage, like if you invest in DHHF and you want to change the D- 
distributions or the dividends, you want to receive them in cash, go to Link Market Services, log in with your shareholder information, and then click uh, the bit where it says, you know, yep. opt out of and, DRP. And make sure you give them your email address and your tax file number as well, yep, so you make there. life as easy as possible. And always uh, head to the ETF provider's website, Beta first shares. quarter call, beta shares, just type in DHHF if you want to learn more about this and read all the fact sheets and documents. We do have an ETF investing course on risk education, so that's a great place to get started if you want to learn more about ETFs after today's episode. We have Best ETFs, which is our ETF research website, which yep. is free to the public. And we also have our ETF membership service, RAS Core, where you can get Owen's research on all types of different ETFs, either if you want to go with the pre-mixed or the DIY approach, we've got research on both of those. Yep. And uh, I would say that if you are interested in taking the course, this is something that we haven't announced yet, but we may as well announce it now, is that if you do have a, a RAS membership, a premium membership, you do get access to all of our beginner courses. So you don't have to, we still get people buying the courses on RASC education, but if you're a member, you can just head to your account and then you'll find a coupon code to use on the education website and that will get you into everything basically except for the Value Investor Program. So um, yeah, don't pay for a full, full price for a, a course, just go to your account page. Yeah, so plenty to take away from today. It's always good to talk about ETFs and discuss them a bit more because this can be applied when you're researching your own ETFs and some of the thought patterns we go through and what we have a look at. So mm -hmm. if you are interested in researching ETFs, head to the ETF provider's website, make sure you have a look at lots of different places and start comparing to find the best option for you. And maybe just add a few to your watch list in your brokerage account if it's all new to you and you just want to understand how it all works a bit more. Yeah, I like it. So just put it on your watch list. You're not going to go horribly wrong buying this ETF or if you already own it, congratulations. It's, you know, of all the 230 ETFs on the ASX, this one would probably be in the top 10 for starters. For people that are just starting out, it's a great pick. So you've done well to get this far. Uh, keep it going. Don't worry about analysis by uh, paralysis by analysis. <laughs> Just get started investing. That's that's the key. So, Kate, as always, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, where our mission is to improve the financial futures of all Australians. If you'd like to learn more, create a free account at rusk.com.au forward slash account to download free episode workbooks, bonus resources, and take our amazing free personal finance courses. You can also join our online community by following the link in the description. If you enjoyed the show, what we'd love is for you to leave us a snappy review on iTunes. And you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Rask Australia. Kate and I are also on both of those channels. Finally, if you have any feedback, suggestions for episodes or guests to come on the show, or you just have a question for us, shoot us an email at podcast at rask.com.au. This podcast was proudly sponsored by InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginner Investors. Build your investing confidence for only $49.50. Learn what it takes to be a successful investor with InvestSmart's Bootcamp for Beginners. This online course is self-paced over three months with live weekly webinars designed to help you achieve your financial goals and create wealth. To start your investing journey today, head to investsmart.com.au bootcamp or simply click the link in your podcast player.